We're going to be starting our uh, week uh, five to six, I think it's a five-week study on some of the different disciplines of the spiritual life. Some of you have gone ahead and decided to buy the book, Celebration of Discipline. You do not need to have the book to follow along perfectly fine. I'm just using it a bit as a guide, but I'm throwing a lot more stuff in that I believe is pertinent to us that fits what we're studying. So if you do not have the book, you will not feel left behind in any sense at all. But some people have wanted to be challenged by it, and a few people have already come up to me and talked about how deep some of the things we're going to be learning about are. And my response to that is, and I shared this with our table out there, if I were going to ask all of us to uh, get our sneakers on and go for a 10-mile run together, other than Shannon and maybe Paul, um, Paul, do you run too or not? Yeah, so I thought so. So the rest of us are going to be like, see you guys, go ahead, right? But if I said, hey, let's just get ourselves ready and we're going to try to jog around the church once, most of us feel like, okay, we can, we can handle that, right? We could go around the sanctuary once. I've already checked it, 65 steps. So it's 65 steps. So, um, okay, well then it's 72 steps for you. Boy, we're starting now. You might have to get out the wand and take care of things for me. So uh, my point is that what we are studying, I know is some of the deep calls to deep stuff of the Bible. That's why we're purposefully doing it during Lent. Do not get overwhelmed by it. My goal is that every lesson together we'll discuss simple steps to begin a process of implementing that particular discipline into your life. So in a, in a way we're going to start looking at, okay, let's say run around the sanctuary one time versus going and running around the neighborhood. And so if you hear stuff and you're like, whoa, that's way beyond me. To be honest, everything I'm teaching tonight is way beyond most of us, to be frank. It was the most challenging book I've ever read, second most challenging book outside the Bible I've ever read in my life. And so um, as we read that, keep that in mind. You are not behind everybody. We are all trying to approach this together. And we are not going to go in the order of this book. We're going to go in the order of what I think kind of balances it out across across the different weeks that we're going to be doing this because there's three sections in this book one is the inward disciplines stuff inwardly we do like fasting praying study meditation the uh, the second one is the outward discipline like solitude serving people submitting and the final one is about confession worship guidance kind of things we do together and so we're starting today with the discipline of solitude. Because I believe almost all the other ones can find a foundation in the discipline of solitude. And then next week we'll be doing the discipline of worship. And so each week I'll let you know what's coming the following week then. So this week is what? And next week is? <laughs> right. So if any of the topics as you might look at them, those of you that have the book sound good, let me know and I'll take that under consideration. Well, let's start with prayer. Almighty Christ, as you want us to apply these principles to our life, not, not for the sake of making us think that we're, we're better than anyone else, Lord, but so that we can truly draw nearer to you and let our lives be more of an offering to you. Would you reveal to us how each one of us, Lord, is meant to take these truths that you put in your word and then put them into practice. Be our guide, I pray. Amen. Well, the goal of each week, this week we're talking about solitude. And so the goal will be is to have these practical things at the very end to help us practice it. And then next week for the first five, seven minutes, we're going to talk about some of the ways that we may have practiced it so we can learn from one another. The first thing about the discipline of solitude. Some people call it the discipline of silence. I, I tend to lean towards the word solitude a little bit more. Loneliness is something we've all experienced. Loneliness is an inner emptiness. Solitude is an inner fulfillment. 
Because loneliness means we feel separated from the other, from everyone else. Whereas solitude means we are purposefully drawing away to engage with who? With our Lord. So it is not some type of a meditation where we're trying to empty ourselves. That is not what solitude is. It's a matter of trying to unite ourselves with the Lord so we're quieting ourselves down. Those of us that have had kids or grandkids, I'm sure we have said to them before, turn that off so you hear me, right? And most parents said amen a thousand times over, right? Right. That is what solitude is. We're willingly, willingly saying, Lord, turn some of the stuff off that's in my life so that I can hear you better. It's a purposeful act of sacrifice and praise to God. Now, I don't know if you realize it, but for, for many people, when they're feeling alone, do you know what they often do? I can't hear you. You didn't want me to hear it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Many people in our society, did someone say something? Yes, thank you. Turn on the TV, flip on their social media, go to their TikTok, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever it might be. Why? Because it feels like it's building a connection. But we know there is no, has anybody ever had a true, real connection after watching a television program? Not that you haven't enjoyed it, or maybe you could feel like you could relate to what was going on, but you never said, that's going to change my life forever. Right? Am I pretty accurate about that, about a television show, no matter how much you liked it? And when you get on social media, there's actually a lot of science out there, or, or psychological science out there, saying that the more you overindulge in social media, and even in television, the more it can cause depression. Because you're trying to fill a need in your life of connection with an abstract thing, a passive medium. You know, we can leave the TV on all day, and whether we're in the room or not, it keeps playing, right? We are irrelevant to it. And so when we look at the discipline of solitude, friends, we are challenged because now we are looking at an active engagement with God. And one of the hardest things for most of us, not all of us, but most of us to do is to simply be quiet. And I don't mean just not talk. I mean shut everything off. I have to laugh. I don't know if you've ever seen some of the funny memes where it's like, would, for a million dollars, would you be willing to live in a cabin in the woods with no internet for a year? I'm like, absolutely. But for most people, that's what it feels like. You'd have to pay me a million dollars to get away from everything that's going on around me. Well, the discipline of solitude is saying, Lord, I want to give up the noise for a season so I can especially hear you. Now, we know there's some noise we can't give up whether it's a job or a family. You know, we can't say, kids, I can't go home tonight to my, to my kids and say, kids, I'm beginning the discipline of solitude so none of you can talk for the next week. How's that going to work? I might, get I might get three minutes. I might get three minutes. It doesn't, so there's real life around us, but we're going to learn tonight how to find a place of inner solitude with the Lord, even in the midst of the noise around us. All right. Well, thanks for hearing that introduction. Everything else will be a lot more interaction. I just wanted to kind of set us up on the same page. All right. Can anyone, now I want to leave Jesus' examples out right now, but can anyone think of any other places in the Bible where somebody willingly chose, or even unwillingly chose, or were given solitude? What's that? I hadn't thought of that one. Yeah. I'm sure there was no internet inside the whale. <laughs> That's very true. There wasn't? What's that, Martin? The oh, that's right. It was a great fish. You're right. See, you've been in my class too long. There's just so much knowledge pouring out of you. Anyway, Greg, did you say something? Enoch, certainly, when he, he would walk with the Lord, he would separate himself and walk with the Lord. I hadn't thought of that one either. Anyone else? Right, I said, let's hold the Jesus examples because we're going to go all through Jesus' life and see how he walked this out for us. But, so we will get to those. Anyone else? Hmm? David, when would David have practiced solitude? When he was in, when, oh, when he was in the cave running from Saul, right? And if there was ever a time somebody felt rejection, you'd think it would be David, right? He had done all these things for God and for Saul's kingdom, and then he gets, you know, kicked out in a sense. He had to run for his life, and he hides in a cave, right? Yeah. Joseph. Oh, in the pit, or... A number of times in the pit, in the jail, and kind of on and off throughout his whole life, right? 
Anyone else? Elijah, certainly he was in the cave. We're actually going to look at that in just a minute. Abraham, I agree, but which one, which part of his life? Man, Martin built up the class so high, and now you, you've got Abraham getting the Ten Commandments. I'm just kidding, Shelly. <laughs> yes, when he went up on the mountain to be alone with the Lord, right? Because he took half the group, he took the leaders up with him, and he said, you guys hang out here halfway up, and he went all the way up. That's really good. And he saw the Shekinah glory, the power of God. Yeah. Did I see somebody else's hand? Yeah, Paul. Garden of Gethsemane, he certainly calls that. that that's an, a real evident place. And then he wanted his disciples to do the same, and they, uh, <laughs> they, they didn't do so hot. Their solitude turned to sleep, which can happen, and I'm going to argue is not always bad. Sometimes if we quiet ourselves before the Lord, he can bring such peace that we fall asleep. And then we often will get up feeling guilty, but why? If the Lord allowed you to find his peace and rest, that's a good thing, right? Right. Right. Okay. Yes, that was Elijah before then he, he went into the cave. Yes, yeah, the birds fed. Yeah, he was get fed by the birds. You know, I think that's a nice provision, but, you know, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, regurgitated food. I'd even argue St. John on Patmos when he wrote the book of Revelation. That he was thrown into a prison up on Patmos. And so I think that's a real, and there were other places too, but that's good. Terry, did you have your hand up? If you did, what would you have said? <laughs> What's that? Okay. <laughs> Peter. When he went up, yes, in Acts, when he went upstairs, had a vision with the Lord. So my whole point is, do you see how solitude is all throughout the Bible? Pretty much, yeah. And even, I could even, if you want to go woman of God, I can go Deborah, where she would go off up on a hill, and she would spend time with, with her God, and then people would come, and she would teach the people. She would be empowered by that. So yes. So can we agree that all throughout the Bible, solitude is practiced by great men and women of God, right? Okay. So we're good. Now, the one example I wanted to pull out real quickly for us, and that one of you mentioned it, comes from 1 Kings chapter 19. And in 1 Kings 19, Elijah's been through the, the gauntlet of difficult times. And he finally comes to this, this cave. And the Lord says, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. And many of you are familiar with this story. I've preached on it a number of times. Where first a powerful wind comes. Is God in the wind? No, he's not in the wind. I guess I need to preach on it again. Okay. There was a great and powerful wind that tore up the mountains and the rocks, but the Lord was not in the wind. Then the wind, there was an earthquake, or after the wind there was an earthquake, but guess what? The Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. Then we're told after all of those wild events, there was what? Still, small voice, and God gave comfort and direction to Elijah and actually would prepare Elijah for the last section of ministry of his life that and I share that passage with you because for most of us as we enter in and seek this week to enter into the discipline of solitude it is going to be hard to tell the wind and the rain and the storm and the fire to shut up it will just keep coming and coming and coming and I was going to go ahead to this later on, but let's just touch on it. What are ways that you think might help a beginner with this discipline to start enter, entering into it? Yeah. Right. It's tough, isn't it? I can't speak for you folks, but every three, four minutes, I get a notification from someone or something all the time. It's always up. Like a what? A designated prayer. Uh, see, that's the start. Isn't that the start of it, Kansas? Where you, you just say, you know, this is what I'm going to do, no matter what. It's kind of like going out and starting running, where you can wake up and you're like, you know, I'm kind of tired, and 
looks kind of cold out this morning, might be rain. I think tomorrow's a better day to start. But no, you had set that time to go do it. And so you set that time for God, and you say, I'm going to spend 10 minutes in quiet before the Lord. And now, here's something. Do you have to receive something for it to be worthwhile? Just something to, to think about. Because that would be selfish Christianity, wouldn't it? God, I spent 10 minutes with you. Nothing happened. What's your problem? I mean, that's pretty much what you'd be saying to God, isn't it? It's called a sacrifice of praise that we give to God. And so just taking 10 extra minutes in the morning or 10 minutes in the evening or 10 minutes wherever, maybe you cut your lunch break short 10 minutes for a, for a season and you say, God, I'm going to spend this quietly with you. These are moments. In fact, my goal for us will be to find at the very end what's called little moments of solitude four or five times a day where you just take five minutes here or there. And if you do that four or five times a day, you get almost half an hour of solitude, right? You're all not liking that idea. Well, we're going to be challenged nonetheless with it. And that's okay. And so, so let me move real quick to Psalm 23. It's familiar to all of you, and that's why I picked it. But in Psalm 23... Imagine with me for a moment. I, I, I don't think I've ever asked you all to do this before. But just close your eyes for a moment, all right? Kind of zone out the person's next to you. Zone out all the things you're doing for the day. All the weight of the stuff you're carrying in. I'm carrying it into, And just release it. And just start thinking about, the Lord's my shepherd. And so I won't be in need or I won't have want. And just start thinking about what that looks like as God, as a shepherd, directing you. He makes me lie down in green pastures. If we have a blindfold on and he's leading us, he's the only one that can take us to those green pastures, right? And he sits us down on the soft, fertile grass and we just enjoy the quietness, the sound. And not only is it the sound of the air, but it says that as he sits us down, he leads us beside quiet waters. And so our soul is restored. So all of a sudden it's quiet. We, we can't see, and we hear the, the trees, the birds, we hear the stream all around us, the sounds, and it's just God guiding us. It says, He guides me in my paths of righteousness for His name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, now if you're blindfolded, it might feel different as you descend down, right? Sometimes if you go down into a valley, it gets a, a different temperature. It gets a little cooler, right, sometimes. And you feel yourself going down. You can sometimes hear the, the quiet, and it feels intimidating sounds you don't recognize. But he says, I'm going to fear no evil, for you're with me. And every time we want to take off that, that blindfold so we can kind of guide our own paths, it says, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. In other words, I can see God lovingly whacking my hand <laughs> as I try to take that uh, thing off my eyes, saying, I got this, trust me. And so, well, you can open up your eyes. <laughs> this is, in a way, what the discipline of solitude is. It's closing ourselves up to all the ways we want to work our life and just listening to God. And we're promised throughout the Scriptures that the first time we may not hear the Lord, the second time, we, the eighth time we may not hear the Lord. But there will come a point where we're starting to hear His voice more clearly because we've shut all of it out. I remember, how many of you watched MASH growing up, right? I caught the, we caught reruns of MASH, of course, you know, us. But I remember watching MASH, there was this one time, I, it, was, it was Hawkeye, was that his name? Hawkeye, I think, Hawkeye. And so he was blinded, but because he, he, had, he had gotten something in his eyes, he was blinded in that episode, and he kept talking about how the food tasted better, how the sounds were clearer, how the smells were richer. That is what it is to shut off the noise for a while and allow the Lord in solitude to speak to us. So, all right, any thoughts before we get into the nitty-gritty of this, uh, the more practical application? We're all good? You're not already overwhelmed, are you? You're just scared about what the nitty-gritty steps are going to be. I don't blame you. So, all right. Jesus' life. Can anyone think of a time in Jesus' life when he chose solitude? Okay. That's good. That means you were listening this week when I preached, brother. Thank you. When he went out into the desert for 40 days. And um, I won't ask you to flip to all the scriptures. You're welcome to, of course. But uh, I'm just going to do it more quickly. In Matthew chapter 4, we read about Jesus marching into the desert by choice, right? He went by choice. 
And Jesus goes into the desert. He says he was led by the Spirit into the desert, which means God can lead us into that place of solitude. And we learned that he had tremendous spiritual victory there, didn't he? Right. Can you think of another time? Josh. Yes. Now you're going to make me have to, I got out of order. I'm going to have to figure out where that was. But yes. Okay, I think that's Matthew 14. Give me one second here. Before he chose the 12. Yep. The night before he died, Gethsemane, right? All right, well, I'm going to share with you six, five or six times Jesus chose solitude. And I'm going to ask you to tell me what was going on in his life and why you think that benefited him and why he chose that, all right? So you folks become the teachers, I just become the speaker. I like that. In Mark chapter 1, it says very early in the morning, the beginning of his ministry, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went to a solitary place where he prayed. Why do you think, uh, clearly Mark wrote this to show us that this was a habit of Jesus. What, what do you, why do you think Jesus made this a habit in his life? Okay, it inwardly prepared him for all of the outpouring that would have to happen. Can we relate to that? Do we need to be filled inwardly to release the spirit of the presence of Christ outwardly? <coughs> okay, anyone, anyone else think have an idea or an opinion why he did that? He wanted to connect with his father and hear his voice for guidance and direction before the whole day started. Can we relate to that? Yes, okay. But let's move on to the second one. The second one is an interesting one. At least I thought it was an interesting one. Many of you are, are familiar with the story of how John the Baptist was horribly killed because of preaching the truth. And they came to Jesus and they told him what happened to his dear cousin John the Baptist, who he had such an incredibly close relationship with. As soon as he's told about it, it says then, when Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. So why do you think Jesus felt the need to withdraw after hearing such a gut-wrenching news? To mourn sadness? Yep. Okay. So you think there was a celebratory side to it. But Jesus was still human. And just like when Lazarus died, we read that Jesus wept. Do you think there was also a grieving side? <laughs> right. The, the grief tends to come first. I, I, I don't think either, I think, I think it's both and, so I want to be clear. But I do think there's a grieving side to it. And I think we sometimes overlook the fact that Jesus felt the human emotions that we feel he was just without sin. And so Jesus felt like it was important for him to get alone in a solitary place. I mean, here he takes a boat to get away. That's pretty serious, right? Jump in a boat and you ever do that at your place there, Tanya? Just get in your boat and just go across from everybody to get away. Get away from everybody. <laughs> yeah, the bicycle does it too, though, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. And even when other people are close, even just in... Even in a circumstance, you know, for us today, even though other people might be close to the person we cared for that passed, they knew them differently, you know. And so there, it's your own experience that you're going through personally. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. He had that connection, and you know, he was there for the baptism. He was there all the way through, and so.
Yes. Right, because he loved his disciples and his followers, but we can love our family, but sometimes they can weigh us down a little bit when we're trying to work on something else. And so, well, here's another example. Jesus feeds the 5,000. Can we agree that's a pretty miraculous thing? Amen? Right, we've had some good church dinners, but not that good, right? So the apostles gathered around Jesus, reported to him all they had ta taught, and because so many people were going, uh, they didn't even have a chance to get something to eat. And he said, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. And so right before they feed the 5,000, what does Jesus do? He pulls away to pray and meditate with the Lord to hear God's will for what's about to happen. I hope you're seeing the, the consistency here. So many of us long to hear God's voice more, to have his guidance, to have him direct us, to, have, to hear uh, almost like a prophetic word so that if we meet somebody, we know how to minister to them. It comes by separating ourselves away. I think we can all agree if Jesus needed to do that, how much more so us. And I do think it's harder today than it was then, but that doesn't negate the need to do it. Amen? All right. So one, let's just, there's about five or six more, but I'm just going to go to one more. And it's one that was mentioned for us already. Because there's times where he gets away before he heals somebody, before he preaches and ministers. But in Matthew 26 is the one most of us are familiar with. In Matthew 26, 36. Where it says, Jesus was with his disciples and he went to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there to pray. He wasn't able to take a boat. He wasn't able to take a bike. <laughs> he wasn't able to, he just had to do the best he could to move to another part of the uh, uh, orchard there to get alone with God. And there are many of us here that it is difficult for us to find time alone with God. I mean, not because we don't want to, and not even because it's hard, but just because life is so packed that it's hard for us to quiet ourselves and actually listen to the voice of God in solitude. And that's why we're going to start moving forward in our, as the lesson continues, learning about how to hear God's voice in the small moments of solitude so he can grow us to be able to have more spiritual endurance to be able to handle the larger areas of solitude. But before we do that, let's just speak very real with each other. What are some of the great hindrances to Christians spending time alone with God in solitude? Just practical hindrances that we deal with. Mm -hmm. So it's right. That's wonderful. Yeah. Yep. And we don't have to make an appointment, right? Right. I'll go back to you in a second. And I heard some people say time. What? Why is time so hard? Well, we all have the same amount of time, don't we? But we all have the same amount of time. But we don't all have the same life. Don't all have the same life. I was just playing with you a little bit, so more difficult, right? And every day is different, right? Some days have more gaps in them. Others, it's like bam, 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 bam to the next thing. And I say bam, bam, but sometimes those bams have three things going on at once here. Then you're jumping over here while you're doing the other three things. And it's just very, very difficult. So time and a packed schedule can be difficult. What else? I'm sorry. I, I told Anna I'd call on her next. I'm sorry. So he's taken what is, in a sense, a challenging situation for you, and you've, and you've allowed the Lord to turn it around in some ways to use it to, to be blessed and, and to hear from him in that time. That is exactly what we're talking about, Ann. That's good. Martin? Yes, they do. Physical family and church family. Martin as our junior ward, and we give him 101 things to do every week around the church. So that fills up the schedule too, doesn't it? Man. What kind? Mm -hmm. 
life in general. So just the buzz of each day, right? Right? That's one I had written down. I didn't know if people got Is Did you hear what he said, folks? Is we don't tend to like silence. Now, there's a few interesting people that do, and that's wonderful that they do. But for a lot of us, it's very awkward sitting in silence, isn't it? I mean, if I said, let's pray, how long would it take for me to sit in silence and not start till you felt like, does he want me to pray? Does he want me to say something? Is he having trouble coming up with something? You could make it 10 minutes. You can make, that's not bad. <laughs> a few seconds, I know. I know. And, and you know what's interesting about that? And I just want to, I, I had skipped over it earlier, but I just want to touch on it real quick. Is there's actually a Bible verse that talks about all the things that we're talking about right now. Uh, it comes, and you've heard me share it before, but it comes from uh, Ecclesiastes 5, where Solomon, you know, supposedly the most knowledgeable man in the world, I don't know about why is this all the time, but definitely the most knowledgeable, he said, guard your steps when you go to the house of the Lord. Go near to listen rather than offer the sacrifice of fools who don't know they do wrong. You're to be quick do not be quick with your mouth or hasty with your heart to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven, you're on earth, so let your words be few. Let me show you what this looks like. Many of you are familiar with the story of the transfiguration, right? Uh, Peter, James, and John are up on the mountain with Jesus. All of a sudden, who shows up? Moses and Elijah. And all the glory of heaven's there. And it's this incredible moment. And at no point... Does Jesus say, Peter, what do you think? Does your Bible say that? No. At no point does he engage with Peter at all. And yet after this incredible moment, Peter's like, uh, but why don't we go and, uh, I'm kind of, he just had just woken up. He said, why don't we go and uh, make a tabernacle for you and Moses so you guys can hang out here. And he starts, and Jesus pretty much just says, be quiet, Peter. <laughs> you don't know what you're talking about. Because there's something about being in God's presence that we're just called to be quiet. But unfortunately, and I think this is just a human condition, we tend to feel like we're not accomplishing something if we're not doing something. I have never applied to a position at a church and had them say, we expect you to take a one week, uh, one week time away every year alone in a hotel room or a cabin or whatever and just be alone with God. Now they've encouraged me to go to conferences, right? Because what do you do in conferences? You talk, you learn, you engage, you grow and everything else. You grow your brain. And so if I say I'm going to a conference, I'm just like, amen, Pastor, man, have a good time. But the idea of saying I'm going to get away for a week or get away even for a couple days, it seems so contrary to effectiveness in human nature, doesn't it? And I'm saying there's one who struggles with it deeply also. I am one who always feels like I should be busy. Now, <laughs> excuse the funny illustration, but there was this Seinfeld episode. I know my brother likes the Seinfeld. There was a Seinfeld episode where uh, George, had his car had broken down, and it left his car at the Yankee Stadium where he worked. And so the people that came in early thought he was getting there before them, and the person that stayed late thought what? That he was staying there after them. And whenever they'd come in his office, he said, I've learned the trick. If you want to look busy, just look annoyed. And so whenever someone, his boss came by, he'd be like, <sighs> and he would have this look all the time because he felt he had to look busy all the time to be a good worker. Now, maybe in the secular world, that's the case. But in the spiritual world, there's tremendous value to being not busy at times. Now, there are times God calls us to serve, to give, to share, absolutely. But there's also times he calls us to pull away, right? And Jesus' whole life was about pulling away. As your pastor, I try really hard to make sure that no one in this church is over-serving in too many areas. I've even gone to some people in the church, I won't say who, and said, if you want to serve in this new area, I need you to let go of another one because you're going to burn out. And that's unusual, isn't it? I mean, most churches, they just want to kind of suck all they get from you. But it's important that we're refilling 
as we pour out in what we do. And just a few other quick reasons that I think uh, that it's difficult to, to live a life of, of hearing the Lord and spending time in solitude is there's just a lot of us that struggle with ADD, OCD, and other alphabet soup things, right? And it's really difficult to just shut your body down and listen, right? And there's others of us who are introverts and extroverts. It may be a little easier for an introvert to spend time alone with God than an extrovert. Because an extrovert feeds on the, on the interaction of people, right? And if you're sitting there quiet and for some reason you're not hearing from the Lord, it can feel like something's wrong. And I just want to free all of us up right now. If you're spending quiet time alone with God, the goal is not to accomplish something. It's just to be with God him, right? No marriage wants to be a marriage where all they do is do stuff for each other, but never really want to be together just to be together, right? And so we want to be together with God. Any thoughts on that before I move on? Yeah. No, that, that's a great, great, yeah, and I would say, and I'm not trying to be silly, but yes to all the above, because you talked about how you might walk around your property and just talk to the Lord. That is spending time alone with God. There's other times he may invite us just to be quiet before him and try to listen. Ab that is absolutely, to, yep. Yeah. That is a, a, a seeking of you to just engage with him and be around him. I would even say, Tim, if I, hopefully I'm not getting too personal, but when you're out there throwing the ball with the dogs, I believe you can encounter the, the beauty and quiet of God even out when you're doing that. Yeah, you might get some good insights. <laughs> yeah, and so, but that, that's a good question. It's, it's, when I say be in the presence of God, I just simply mean being available for God. It's like texting a friend and saying, I know you're, 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 having, you're having a tough time right now. I just want you to know that I'm happy to come sit with you, help you, take you out to lunch, do whatever would be a blessing to you to help you through this. You're just being available. And part of that availability is just being in awe of God. It's talking to God. It's, 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 um, it can even be serving or doing things for the Lord. Within all of that, there's this ability to still enjoy the silence of being with God at the same time. So, because what, what we're going to get to by the end of this is it doesn't have to be quiet around you to come to a place of silence with God inwardly, right? Yeah. <laughs> right. Does anybody have any advice for calls? He said he has trouble shutting his mind off that it's just running all the time. What's that? What did you say? Did you say Palaton? Oh, I think you said Palaton. Get up there and rig. <laughs> that could work too. Yeah, it does. That is, and that, that's where I was leading to is whether it's the Lord's prayer, and or Lord, yeah, Lord, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy upon me. And I, I would just recommend again, every one of us is wired different in our relationship with God. These are just all ideas. Does everybody hear, hear that? But one thing I like to do is I'll just start either reading the same psalm over and over or the same few verses saying, declaring them over and over because your brain eventually will be forced to lock in here and there with what you're saying. And as you're focusing on that, it's pushed. The, so while he's focusing on the Lord's Prayer, saying it again and again, he's starting to push the other stuff out for a moment. You can't discuss them. Philippians, yes. Yep. 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 Do not be anxious. Right. Quote, quoting, and that's what I mean, just quoting different verses over and over again to make us think about it. Shelly, then, Shelly, then Jim. Good, yeah.
you down where you need to be right 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 and for some of us friends oh i'm sorry jim i said go ahead yeah And I like that. She sleeps? She does so much. <laughs> she ever slept. So, okay, good. But even there with that, if we wake up and we want to spend time with the Lord and we're up for 10, 15 minutes and fall back asleep, did we seek to honor God with what we were doing? Yes. And again, it's not about what are you doing or what is accomplished. It's about being with Him. Uh, doing. Yeah, go ahead. being aware of, of who you're with. Well, let me ask you folks, what are brief moments in your life, or let's just leave it more broad, in people's lives, where you can find moments to just simply say a prayer or simply to just acknowledge, Lord, you are wonderful. You are good. I mean, we even do that in our worship services sometimes, don't we? We just shut it down for a moment and just say, Lord, we're just going to take a moment and just say how great you are and just shut everything. What are areas, can you think of little small solitude moments, a minute, two minutes, 30 seconds, something like that. Bathroom breaks, all right. As long as they're not too challenging, yeah, go for it, that's fine, yeah, yeah. I hadn't written that down, but that's good. Mm -hmm. That's it. Don't say, oh, okay, because a lot of times we'll never get back to it. Hit it, that moment, or as soon as you can, that moment, that's good. I'll just keep going across. Somebody had their hand up. It's it's that stopping for a moment and just listening. Yeah. So you're saying every time your finger's ready to go up, stop and take a moment of solitude. Is that, is that what you're, you're saying? All right. Okay, good. Good. Hang on. Martin had to stand up. James, then I'll come back to you. Go ahead, Martin. Yes, that's really good. You know, anytime you an ambulance, fire truck, and I'll tell you, if you live around here, that's pretty much 15 times a day or something like that. So, yeah. You will be doing it all the time. Great.
That's funny because me, obviously God likes to discipline me more than you because that doesn't happen. And so for me, I had put every time I hit a red light, it gives me time to have a moment of quiet with the Lord. And so uh, hopefully I can bless you with that right there. So with those red lights coming. <laughs> Okay, folks, let me, I want to make sure I get to this last part, but just a couple other ideas I had. When you're at the doctor's office and you're bored out of your mind waiting for the next, you know, them to call you in or dentist or wherever you might be for an appointment, even get your car at the garage, take a few moments there. Pray for the business. Listen to the, because again, the prayer and the thanksgiving is very vital, and we're even going to be covering that in future weeks. But this is also about just the listening. Again, because when we just listen and nothing happens, we feel like we have to do what? Make it happen. Well, God's not speaking right now, so God, let me pray. No, maybe he just wants you to listen. Because according to Scripture's promises, I can guarantee you that as you and I spend more time purposefully listening in solitude, God will speak and reveal things probably that we weren't even expecting. This isn't some little fancy thing a preacher is saying to you. These are, the Word of God constantly talks about him speaking to us in those moments. And so... All right, well, let me cover the last part of this, and then we'll be done in the next 10 minutes for the night. One thing that the discipline of silence or solitude will do for us is it will increase our spiritual senses more. The discipline of silence will help us hear God better. Now, I don't know what you do to kind of lock into God. I have my little Alexa in my room set every morning for Gregorian chant. Now, Inwardly, I'm the type of guy that would like to set it to hard rock to wake me up. But what I have found is if I started a little early and let it wake me up, where does it put my mind? It puts my mind upward. Instead of trying to get adrenaline going to get out of bed and get going and get the kids ready and, da -da 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 and all that other stuff, it gives me those few moments to kind of just listen. A lot of it's in another language. It's kind of, you know, ethereal sounding. Oh but it sounds better than that. And so that just gets my mind and my heart set. So use music to your advantage in the discipline of solitude. Some of us, sometimes we just need total solitude, no music at all. But sometimes that background sound can help focus us upward. And it's now become like a psychological thing for me that when I wake up and I hear that Gregorian chant music, that it f reminds me, start thinking upward with your day before you start going outward. I didn't mean for it to do that, but that's been the regular habit now that it's been going on for months and months. So it'll increase your spiritual hearing and you can utilize um, things to help you hear better. So I even sometimes like to, I don't know, I like to go to Panera and I'll just get a booth where I can face the wall and then I'll just put my big uh, noise canceling headphones on and then I'll just shut out everything else as I just try to listen to God and sometimes read the word and stuff like that. And so Panera is great for that because I got all those tasty teas. So you just keep refilling throughout the day as you're doing that anyway. But give you mean looks after a while. All right. What's another sense besides hearing? Smell, right? The sense of smell. All right. Well, we're going to start with smell, and then we'll go, you're trying to rush me in. What is the, for some, let me just ask some of you, what are some of the beautiful smells for you that when you smell them, you're like, that is a really pleasant, wonderful aroma for me? Coffee. Coffee. What? I thought you said whiskey. <laughs> it's like, to each their own, brother, to each their own. Okay, so what did you say, wisteria? I have no idea what that is. It's a flower. Oh, that's right. You got them blooming out there. All right. Okay. So you got the flower. How about somebody else? Lavender. What? Lavender. Must be my ears tonight. I don't know. Lavender is a good smell, right? Gordini. You're picking all things. I don't know what they are. I know they're flowers, but. So I feel, I feel so uneducated next to all of you. You know what my answer is? My daughter bought me a candle that smells like Mountain Dew. And it sits next to my, my table where I study. And I just open it and I'm. Mountain Dew. And it has the mountain. So I'm not as educated as all you flower lovers. And so, but it could be the smell of a burning wood. I know I enjoy that. I'm sure many of you enjoy that. But in the quiet of being in God's presence, sometimes you may even just want to set a pleasing aroma, whatever that might be, a flavor of candle or something, to just listen to the Lord. If you ever come by my office, a lot of times Shelly will tell you, you'll smell either, what was that, spiced pumpkin or uh, 
or the pine. Those are the two I really like in my office. And, and you come by and you'll smell those. And that aroma just helps me focus. And so you can use your sense of smell, your sense of hearing. What's another sense real quick? we got to blow through these. Taste, the sense of taste. No, no, convic no condemning at all in this statement. But when was the last time you sat quietly and ate a meal slowly, enjoying each bite, and giving thanks to the Lord for how good it tastes. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Did you say sushi? I'd be thankful he gave that to you. Man, I am. <laughs> you folks have some weird things. Anyway, but think about that. Just time. I, I know we like to fill our time. Me, I'm addicted that when I'm on my own, I like to put something on, on my computer, whether it's a teaching, whether it's you know just a show or a movie, while I'm eating so I can enjoy both at once. Does anybody else do that when you're on your own? And there's nothing wrong with that. But there are also times that we can close that up, turn it off, and just sit. And it might even be with your spouse. Just sit quietly and just agree together that you're not going to talk much during the meal. You're just going to enjoy being with each other, the spouse God gave you, and enjoying the food that he's given you. That is, what's that? I can't. Breakfast and morning prayer. That's another way. And that's, as you're enjoying the food, you're enjoying the food of the word of God all at once. Show off. Anyway, but <laughs> that's good. And so, okay. And then real quick, um, the, seeing, right. Sometimes the most helpful thing you can do is turn everything off. So what are you seeing? Black. And you just sit there and let God speak to you. I know we, I have like, I hardly, it's kind of a walk-in closet type of thing. It's not a giant one, but it's a little bit of one. And we have this like uh, fake fireplace, you know, those kind you plug in and whatever. And I just put that there so it looks like a fake fireplace. That's the only light in that little area. And I just like to sit and listen at times doing that. But whatever it might be for you, however you can just sit and uh, enjoy what you see and let it enhance your ability to worship. So I'm going to guess across this room, just about, if not all of us, have seen some scenery once or a while and we're just like, praise the Lord. Like you just see God in it. Let those things enhance your solitude. Now the trickiest one I have for you is how can touch help? Touch or feeling. How can that enhance solitude? That would be good. Very. I didn't thought of that. Yep. Something, yeah, and, or even a chair that you're, you're relaxed in. I had thought about, a, you know, a warm shower if you're a bath person type of person. Just spending an extra five minutes with the shower pouring on you and just say, Lord, I'm just going to quietly enjoy you right now as that warmth comes over my body. Yeah, Candace. Kneeling. Getting knocked to go. That, no, that's good. Sometimes you need to feel the uncomfortableness. And in fact, over here, I don't know if you've noticed, we have a kneeler with really, really soft cushion. And then we have the one my parents bought me when I graduated uh, seminary, which does not have a cushion. <laughs> that's, that's, that's for the really spiritual <laughs> right there. <laughs> yeah. That's right, feeling the, feel it on each beat, yep, each prayer. That's right, that's right. And so, either, either way. Right. Right, right. Or if Charlie wants to give you a massage while you're praying, there could be that too, yeah. Just, just saying, just saying, you know, there's that, but... Okay, I've used a little bit of humor here, a lot of humor hopefully tonight, to help us kind of embrace this, because I think humor helps us to go deeper at times. But I will, as we close this in the last minute, I do want to remind us that in the scriptures, in Psalm 46, we're given this passage. It says, be still and know that I am God. That's a statement. It's uh, bordering on a command, that there's something about the stillness and being aware of how great, great God is. And when we make God bigger, what does that do to our problems and situations? Makes them go away? They don't go away, 
but it helps us see the greatness of him and the smallness of the moment of that situation, even if it is a tr just tremendously difficult one. So that's why he invites us to say, Be still, know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. The Lord Almighty will be your fortress. God is. And that's, that's, that's right there. That's right there. And so, so I just leave you with those thoughts of ways during our week. So just real quick to highlight. Find the small moments a red light, a doctor's appointment, whatever we've all talked about, those little moments, and say, Lord, I'm just going to take a moment and just worship you, just think of you in this moment. And then also this week, to see if, even if not daily, a few times this week, you can just take a time alone and utilize some of the things we've talked about, whether it's the seeing, the hearing, the touching, whatever, and just the tasting, and spend time acknowledging and looking to God in that quiet place. And let you're going to find, and I'm going to find, that as we talk about these other Lenten disciplines that we're going to look at, almost all of them can come back to this foundation of hearing and being alone with the Lord first and foremost. And it will enhance our ability to do all the others. So that's your assignment for this week. Just try to find those different areas. And then next week we'll talk about them a little. Shannon, do you have something? Spring break starts. All right, so let's do this net two weeks from now. No, you're right. That is a challenge. I agree. Yeah, absolutely. So <laughs> I hadn't thought about that. But, but you got half a week to get started. And then they, <laughs> you need your quiet time. You know, in the book, I don't know if you've read, for those of you that haven't read the book, but most of you, that he talks about in your house, maybe one night a week or whatever, say, if mom or dad are in this chair, it's our quiet chair. That if we're here, it means that we need a few moments alone just to listen to God. And then, you know, the, the, the kids will try to break that, but when you ignore them, you're not really ignoring them because you've told them that this is your moment right now. Right? I use my car, but the same idea. I, I just go out to my car a little bit. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. That gives you that, that, that time to process and think and pray. That's good. That's good. Yeah. 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 Um, so, all right. Well, does anybody have any questions or thoughts or anything they, they want to ask about before I dismiss everybody? Do you feel properly challenged? Me too. Me too. These last few days as I've been rereading all of this, I'm like, wow, I thought I had this kind of down and I'm realizing there's a whole nother level. <laughs> That's what's nice about God is you can never exhaust him. Amen? All right, well, Lord Jesus, just help every man and woman in this place to learn the discipline of silence in a greater way than we know it right now. Father, I pray against the spirit of condemnation that would make anyone feel like they're failures or that they can't do it. That is not from you. And I ask, Lord, that you just continue to encourage us to draw near to you and teach us and show us these smaller moments that we can engage with you and just pull away for us to enjoy you more. In the name of Jesus, amen. All right, and thank you everyone for watching. A good group tonight. It was good to have you.